in the third chapter in Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild, any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who, gave, who you gave to be with me she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate it. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, God said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to the man, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Y'all are going to die. I just stopped crying. I'm laughing so hard. I'm trying not to start back again because, oh my God. Okay. So I'm at the Wawa and um, I had just been surfing on Facebook because I was trying to, um, on Friday, my children get to watch a video, like a movie after school and they get to eat ice cream. And so I picked them up late. And so I was trying to burn some time at the Wawa and I read a little article, it was like a Christmas article about how everybody's so generous over the holidays and it makes everything so magical. And so y'all, I was just in this place, hold on a second. Oh, gosh, I'm about to die. Y'all are gonna, <laughs> I can't even contain myself. Hold on, I'm so sorry. I was, um, hey mama, you're gonna die. lady behind me is buying her um, ginger ale and I realize all she has is ginger ale and so I'm like oh, I'm feeling the holiday spirit hey Michelle how are you I'm gonna buy this woman her ginger ale and so 
I'm like, are you only buying ginger ale? And she's like, yes, why? I was like, I've got you. I'm going to get your ginger ale. And she's like, why? I said, well, because I'm just feeling the holiday magic, you know, and I can't afford to buy people Starbucks like all of those givers do because those drinks are like seven or eight bucks. I can buy myself some Starbucks, but not everybody else some Starbucks. So she laughed and I bought her ginger ale and I was like, happy holidays. And we like, you know, it was a precious moment. So I walk outside and I'm still in this mindset that the holidays are so magical. <laughs> and I see this man. He is. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I see. I see this man. He's cleaning my windshield. <laughs> I'm convinced this is the Christmas magic, and so I'm like, oh gosh, I'm. I just love this time of year, you know. So I walk up to this man, and I am like. This is my favorite part of humanity. I love Christmas so much. Thank you for doing this. And I give him a hug. <laughs> it wasn't my car. <laughs> he was parked directly in front of me. And he was cleaning his own windshield. <laughs> She goes on for two more minutes. <laughs> you know, we all say, wouldn't it be wonderful if Christmas was, you know, that Christmas spirit was all year long? And, and wouldn't it, maybe actually hugs in the gas station would be real because people would really be noticing, oh, you could use some a little uh, touch up on your windshield and, and uh, people would be buying ginger ale, what have you, for each other if there was uh, just out of the joy of it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that actually did? extend all year long, except maybe without all the sentimentality and kind of that, you know, kind of more that sappy side. But honestly, we actually took Jesus' words and the words of the Hebrew Scriptures literally, um, we're going to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we're going to actually act like that all year long. So more hugging, less hating, more helping, less hurting um, all year long. But we don't. It's so obvious that that would be so much better, right? It would be such a joyful world if we did. We know what it takes, uh, and yet somehow it doesn't happen. Why is that? Well, this uh, series, we've been exploring the, the, the hymn, Joy to the World. It's the 300th anniversary of that great hymn written by Isaac Watts in 1719. And uh, this week we're focusing on a verse that almost is in almost none of your hymnals, if you may have grown up with. Um, it's verse 3, because it's a little darker verse, so people will kind of want to take out that dark one. He's kinda, he knows why we don't keep this up um, all year long in this verse. He identifies that reason. Uh, uh, he, so he articulates this yearning, a yearning, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He, Jesus, will come and make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. The curse is found. Now that's a directly, direct allusion to the scripture we just uh, heard this morning, that no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns Thorns infest the ground, and that, that curse, that's right out of uh, the third chapter of, of Genesis, that story of the mythological story of Adam and Eve that is may not meant to tell us exactly what happens how many thousand years ago, but it's really meant to tell us what happens over and over and over and over again in the human heart on up to the the present day. The story is quite dramatic, of course. They you know they they, they make a mistake, they 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 pick the forbidden fruit and we Christians tend to look back on this and say, oh, yeah, they were bad. They turned their backs on God. They must have hated God or something. Like, no, they loved God. <laughs> the, the serpent, you know, they perceived this power greater than themselves, saying, you know what? If you eat this, you'll be more like God. And they love God. So why wouldn't you want to 
be more like God if you had the chance. You know, God said don't, but I sure do want to be more like God. And if I knew good and evil, maybe I could just do good, more good, right? And less evil and whatever that is because I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> I mean, isn't it interesting that God never wanted us, according to the story, to, to know good and evil, to be able to discern that? Apparently, God seems to have been of the opinion that there would actually be a whole lot more good being done in the world if we weren't aware of good and evil to begin with. I mean, think about it. Every single war we've ever been fought has been justified by, on what grounds? We're the good people. They're the evil people. We should live. They should die. Yeah, there it goes. Just one fact alone. No, apparently God wanted uh, us not to be so concerned about beating everybody up and ourselves up over our evil acts we do, nor to be so self-congratulatory over uh, the, the good acts uh, we do. Also, apparently God's original intent with us, for us, if the story is true, is that um, life was actually meant to be easier for us than it is now. You saw what, what happened once they, tr they, they turned and, and disobeyed three basic... Um, things happen that make life harder. First of all, God comes walking through the garden, and what's their response? They hide, right? So there is this separation now between ourselves and our creator, this shame. So we hide in the bushes, hoping not to be noticed. So there's the first alienation right there. And then God says, Adam, you know, what did you do? And what, what's his response? He, he blames his wife, I mean, not that like that ever happens, but I mean, <laughs> he plays his wife. And so there is an indication of this separation between human beings that hadn't been there before. We're more alienated from each other and alienated from God. And then what does his wife say? Well, the serpent tricked me and I did. She blames creation, right? And so now there's a separation between ourselves and the earth and the animals of the earth as well. Apparently all those were meant to be much more harmonious before, but there's something about that turning that damped things down. And so those curses you hear are really just recognition that life is harder. You know, we, we, we tend to single out the, you know, the, the woman being, your know, childbirth being made many times greater, and we look back and say, oh, there's patriarchy, you know, for you. But it's not as patriarchal as one thinks. It is, does assume that the woman is focused on child uh, making and raising, and the man is focused on tending the earth. But beyond that, what it's trying to say is that both of you all, your main work is going to be harder than ever. Harder than ever. And it wasn't God's choice. It was just simply living with the implications of, of our choice. And then you can see that God keep, keeps caring for the couple, though. I mean, knitting garments for the couple to cover their sense of shame, not God's sense of shame. And then taking them out of the, the, the garden. We've heard about this part of the story before. Christians keep looking back and seeing this as punishment. Like, oh, they turned their back, they hate God, and now God is going to punish them by taking them out of the garden. No, it's a protection mechanism. Because God sees that if they were to now eat from the tree of the fruit of, the, the, of eternal life, now that separate, that alienated state between themselves and God, between themselves and each other, and between themselves and the earth... That would lock it in for eternity. God says, sets up a condition then by taking them out of the garden such that there is no mistake we can make in this life that has eternal consequences. So that at the end of this life, we have a chance to reboot the system, in essence. Now, the mistakes we make definitely have this life <laughs> consequences, and we may have some working out to do in the next life, I don't know, but certainly the story makes clear the mistakes we make will not have eternal consequences. God is a protecting us, not punishing us, protecting us from ourselves. Incidentally, notice the figure who is kind of ushering the, the couple out of the garden, uh, then protecting the gate with the, the angel with the flaming sword. Looks a lot like Jesus, doesn't he? You know, that's, of course, a, a Christian artist's you know, interpretation of the story, but that interpretation doesn't come out of thin air. It comes from a basic intuition uh, of that, that, that we are being protected by being ushered out of that garden, and also a basic intuition that one day the very one who helped us out of the garden is going to open the door so that we can come home again. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns invest the ground. 
He comes to make his blessings flow all the way as far as the curse is found. To keep it all inside Something will touch me When I least expect it And that sweet familiar sound It'll turn my heart around Suddenly the magic is everywhere trying to be so strong or maybe it's just the story of a baby that this crazy world's forgotten for so long how did we Watching the children play, they haven't got a clue that everything changes and there's little we can do. Then hold them while we have them every day. How did we? From the fifth chapter of Romans. Yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the de dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift pour through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death dealing sin and this generous life giving gift. 
The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes? Sovereign life in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift, this grand setting everything right that the one man Jesus Christ provides? Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got all of us in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. So last week after worship, about uh, 30 or so of us uh, gathered in the chapel to uh, have our first Eden Tree conversation. That is a conversation kind of follow up on my own ideas about there being a new enunciation happening right now around the world to help steer us away from the course we're on and its implications for uh, ministry here, especially amongst our youth and our children and young adults. And it was a fabulous conversation, lots of energy, two hours, in fact, of just really, really uh, fabulous uh, conversation. And afterwards, I, I just received some podcasting equipment in the office. We're going to be doing some podcasting with adults and youth and so forth this coming year, so watch out before warned. Uh, but I thought, hey, what, what a great opportunity. I've got a few minutes to simply record a summary of the, the session today for those who, who had signed up and couldn't make it. I could send it out then. So I, I recorded it, felt really good, uh, and then I uh, played the recording back. And I didn't feel so good. It wasn't what I said uh, out loud. It's really what, how I stumbled all over myself as I said it. In fact, let's just give you a sample of this. Uh, one minute and 14 seconds. Let's just count how many times I say the word um <laughs> here, all right? Let's just try this. Uh, you want to roll that uh, recording? Hi, this is Eric Elmas, and um, I'm making this recording for those who are participating in the Eden Tree Initiative discussions. Um, this is a little recap of what happened uh, yesterday, uh, December 8th, for those of you who weren't able to make it or who simply want to kind of refresh their memories about uh, what went on. It was a very, very excellent um, discussion. Uh, we had a quite a lengthy one, lots of energy to it, and um, basically did three things. Um, one was I kind of recapped what I've been preaching about in terms of a new enunciation um, that I uh, see happening in the world right now that's um, shift recalculating my own um, understanding of uh, what, we need be, what I need to be doing as a minister and, and perhaps what we need to be thinking about as a church and then also then um, getting feedback uh, from people uh, about those ideas and then we started exploring just kind of more concrete um, in concrete uh, ideas for how we could respond to this new enunciation, especially with respect to our um, children, youth, and young adults. Oh, I missed two. <laughs> One minute and 14 seconds, 17 ums. <laughs> Why are you clapping? <laughs> Don't clap for that. You only encourage me. <laughs> Hi, this is Eric. Oh, no, you don't have to play that again. <laughs> Thank God, quite literally, for audio editing software. <laughs> I could go through, find on the top line, find that there, that highlighted, that's where I said, um, and I could just go, cut, and it turns into the bottom line as if it never happened. So, editing 27 <laughs> minutes <laughs> of, uh, of this kind of rate of ums took me a long time, but boy, now you listen to it and it just sounds, you know. Hi, this is Eric Elmas, and I'm making this recording for those who are participating in the Eden Tree Initiative discussions. This is a little recap of what happened yesterday, December 8th, for those of you who weren't able to make it or who simply want to kind of refresh their memories See? about what went on. It was awesome. Very, very no ums. <laughs> Couldn't even tell, and right? Isn't that it. great? And Actually, if you, if you were to isolate... Um, one was I kind of recapped what I've been preaching about in terms of a 
new enunciation. If you were to isolate all those ums, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, not not so good. But you know, some of us have this conception when we meet God. You know, if we when we when we eventually have uh, leave this life and and meet our Creator, that our Creator is going to look over you know, the works of our life and basically isolate all those ums. You know, the the, the simple ones and the more serious ones. And this is what God's going to hear. Um, this is um, the story. Um, um, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, um. <laughs> Yeah, just take every single fault, every single uh, uh, problem that we've had and hear, oh, wow, wow, what a life, huh? But would that really tell God anything about our lives? Did that um set uh, tell you anything about what I was trying to do or what we're trying to do uh, with our lives here? Told us nothing at all. Now, what if when we meet God, actually, in essence, God opens this great book that we ourselves have written. It's called The Book of Our Life with God. And I wonder what, what that book would, would read like. Uh, would God have all just the ums of our lives? The, 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 or would it have just the great things in our lives? Or would it have, would it have both, you know? Um, I want to just offer a, a thought. Um, it's, we think that, that if God were just going to open the book of our lives and... and, and kind of you have it like that edited recording, like look at your life and see just the highlights real and take out all those ums, those, those little ones and those big ones. I think God would at least get, I mean, that may be overlooking quite a bit, but what if, it depends on what the nature of the book is about. If the book is just simply all about you, then yeah, you're going to have everything there. But I don't really think that that's what the book is about. I think the book is about you in your life with God. Specifically, the book is about God telling you, I love you. I love you. And now let's hit the recording now and, and see what, what, what your life records, your response to hearing from God, I love you. Now, if that's the case then the book that God's going to want to hear, or the recording God's going to want to is going to be hearing, is all those places where we responded with, I love you, because that's the nature of the book. Here's how Bill said, I love you. Here's how Chris says, I love you. Here's how Jody says, I love you. What if the book were like that? Well, we might object, well, but aren't there consequences? I mean, there's not just ums, there's some really bad stuff we, 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 we do. We, and we hurt ourselves, we hurt other people. There's some pretty bad stuff. Must there not be consequences for us here? And of course, we say that as if there are no consequences to doing all that stuff already. That it doesn't at all dampen our soul's experience of this life. It does not separate us from God while we live this life or from each other or from the earth. Like it has no effect and so God's got to make up for that all in the afterlife. No, really? But still aren't there consequences? Well, what if the consequence was this? You get to read this book of your life with all that bad stuff taken out, it's just your response. But <laughs> quite frankly, even if you take the bad stuff out, I mean, the amount that what we do when we do bad stuff and we, and we know we've done bad stuff, what, what's our common response? Do we get out there and say, I love you all the more? Or do we shrink back like Adam and Eve did? Do you hide behind the bushes? You know, oftentimes, if we didn't beat ourselves up over the evil we do and the, and the mistakes we make so much, maybe we would have spent a lot of less of our lives hiding in the bushes, feeling like if God only saw who we really are, um, God wouldn't like it very much, so I better just kind of hang back. No, if we knew that we were living this life and, and, and th what's going to be recorded of us is how we've loved God, well, then once we mess up, let's get out of the bush and let's just keep on loving in fact, love all the more. I, if that's not going to be held against me in the end. You know, imagine you read the book of your life and, and you see that there's all kinds of times where actually you could have really written love large and you shrunk back. 
Because there's all kinds of times when love actually does ask of us to take a risk, even a big risk. And oftentimes we shrink back from taking those risks because we're afraid of what the consequence might be now or in the afterlife. I mean, think about it. For a lot of human history, it was actually seen as a sin to protest slavery. Right? So there's all kinds of people uh, about 150 years or so ago who, uh, in our own country, said, you know what, this is not a sin, this is about love. And people were saying, no, that is not a godly thing. But they took a risk on love. There have been all kinds of people in our country who said, uh, who, who were told the message, it is not a godly thing to marry someone from a di- who is a different race as you, or to marry someone who is the same sex as you. In fact, if you do so, you are in, in danger of eternal wrath. And they said, there's something in my heart that says I love more than the risk there, and I'm going to take a risk on love. You know, there's all kinds of times where love asks us to take a risk because the world, quite frankly, doesn't know a whole lot about love. God knows about love. And so when we feel our hearts, we feel the Spirit moving us to take that step, are we going to actually take it and live lar- love large? Or are we going to shrink back and say, well, I've done some stuff. I don't know if I'm such a good evaluator of this, and I certainly don't want to get more stuff, more crime heaped upon me than I already have. Now, what if you knew if you could open the book of your life, read this story, and God said, listen, you can just accept this story as your story now, or I'll give you an opportunity to. If it's not quite the story you wanted to read, I'll give you an opportunity to, I'll I'll put you in another life, either in the, the world you came from or in some other world. And, you, and, 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 and you'll I'll erase all of your memory of this life, but you'll retain all of the beauty that you have inside you right now, all the beauty you've gained, all the closeness to me you have, you can keep. But I'm going to erase all your memory, put you in another life. Would you take that opportunity? Well, to me, it would depend. If God said, uh, and by the way, if you make a mistake in this next life, I will punish you for all of eternity in, a, in, in eternal damnation, I'd say, okay, no, I'm going to stick with the, the puny little life I've already lived in. I'm going <laughs> to hedge my bets and I could just go with this because I do not want to risk that. Right? But what if God said, no, I'm going to put you in a world and I'm going to create this protection mechanism such that no mistake you make has eternal consequences. So you can take a risk on love all you want. And you can even make a mistake. But once you come back here, you're, you're safe. And I'll open the book before you again. You can read your story. Are you satisfied with it? On that basis, I'm telling you, I'll live a thousand lifetimes. I mean, if it means that every time I get to grow in God and then go back and do some hard stuff for a while, but grow in God for a while, too, and then come back and retain all that, yeah, give me a thousand lifetimes. Give me a million lifetimes if it means that after every lifetime, I'm closer and living life more fully as I was created to be as a child of God. Absolutely, sign me up. Oh, there's consequences, right? I've just said I will work really, really, really hard to make a better story than the one I've created. All because God was willing to give me some grace and to keep me safe and to give me an opportunity to create a better story each and every moment of my eternal life. Yeah, sign me up for that paradigm. Now, truth in advertising, I haven't been to the other side, so I don't know that that happens. But the intuitions we get from the deep in the heart of the scriptures should tell us something about the quality of the afterlife we are invited into. When I came back from uh, Israel, uh, you know know that our our group uh, purchased this um, nativity set at a place uh, in Bethlehem that uh, that carves olive wood, and they made this a gift to the church. Uh, I made a gift to myself, too, in that place. It's this statue, which is known uh, by the title, Jesus Forgives His Own Crucifier. Jesus Forgives His Own Crucifier. Why would Jesus do that? Well, we get a hint in the Gospels, in Luke 
You know, that, that, that Jesus does not simply define us by our sin. I mean, that he would not likely look at that crucifier and say, this is what defines you. You are an evil person. Jesus seems to be one who never ate from that fruit. That's what separates from him. He's not God. He is more fully human than we are. He never ate that fruit. He never started defining life in terms of good and evil. So consequently, when he looked, looks at, at us, he says, not evil person, he sees Bill. When he looks at us, he sees not an evil person, he sees Randy. When he looks at us, he sees not an evil person, but Patty. Jesus looked at people as who they are, not as definitions, not as categories. And yeah, he made one big, uh, for sure. But this person likely had a family, likely had children, likely did a lot of beautiful things in the world. And also, not at all unlikely that he, even in crucifying Jesus, he thought he was doing a good thing for someone. If for nobody else but his family to put food on the table. He had no idea who this guy was, just do what he was told. Jesus says from the cross, according to Luke, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Take these uh out. Because <laughs> that's not part of the, the book that you and I are writing. It's about you and your life and your love for God. You responding to God saying, I love you. That's the book. It didn't stop with just Luke. I mean, Paul would take this understanding and, and develop this and see in Christ uh, the second Adam. That one person turned his back on God you know, by eating that fruit, but, but not in a bad way, just trying to be more like God. But Jesus was wise enough apparently not to take that fruit because he knew that as soon as we act on this knowledge of good and evil, we start to categorize people, and worse yet, we start to do what God never intended us to do, which is judge people. They saw that in what Jesus did, he shows us the way back home to that original state by making it perfectly clear that out your sin is forgiven that my sin is forgiven that that's not the book we're meant to write here but the book we might write is about our love for God he frees us to be bold and to write that though that book in big huge letters knowing that if we make a mistake in our loving that's not part of the story that remains. So Paul writes, yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parable to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead-end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous, life-giving gift. The verdict on that one sin was a death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that followed was this wonderful life sentence. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us all in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many people in the wrong. One man said yes to God and put many in the right. Nor mo no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse may be found. Friends, we don't have to wait until we die to make a better story of our life. We're currently writing that story. Can you accept the editing of all of that crap? <laughs> Keep the beauty of your life and then go into the world and live your life according to that story. Make it larger, deeper, more awesome, 
more joyous, more accepting and giving of God's grace.